Hello, everybody. This is Anne Bryant. I am the content creator here at Lowell's Boat Shop, and I just wanted to introduce our people tonight who are going to be speaking. Um, or more, I would like to say that I hope you tell us where you're watching from. I uh, hope you look up the Museum of Old Newbury, and uh, we'll get started in a few moments. And please keep your comments respectful. And I will try to check them for questions at some point during the talk. Thank you so much for watching. Tell us where you're watching from. Okay, ready? Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. I was looking forward to that. We're going to attach them to these guys. Okay, yeah. Where's the, uh, where's my set? Two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's going to be great. 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 It's not. 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 It's not.
Yeah. No, it's not bad. No. Uh, do you want me to take this with me or is it when we leave? Yeah. I'm going to leave it right there. Yes, you guys see it. Totally. No, okay. I'm enjoying it. So, so are we, we live on YouTube? We're live on YouTube over there. Okay. And Graham, if you would like to talk to everybody, you can talk to them right at this microphone here. This one? I'm waiting for the nod from Are you going to sit there like that the whole time? No. Oh, okay. I'm leaving. Okay. I'm leaving you now. Because that's where I get to sit. I got to sit somewhere. <laughs> well, I think all of Anne's I, everyone's you know, here really needs to sit here. It's you know, it's I'm going to sit in that corner. Right? I'm a bad guy. Right, I'm going to go try to sit in the back. Okay. Is this thing on? Is this? Hold on, I'll turn my... It's a oh, hot mic, Graham. Watch out. Hot, there are hot mics everywhere. There are hot Look mics out. everywhere. <laughs> Guaranteed I will say something scandalous. I see some empty seats, Bethany. You promised me a full house. <laughs> <clears throat> we have 86 seats. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm Graham McKay, the executive director at Lowell's Boat Shop. Um, I'll introduce our speaker, our head speaker here in a moment. But um, I will first ask, how many of you guys are members of Lowell's Boat Shop? Thank you. How many are members of the moon? How many are members of neither? <laughs> well, if you raise your hand for Lowell's, and not for the moon, you should join the moon. And if you raise your hand for the moon and not Lowell's, you should join Lowell's. And you could probably do both here tonight. Um, we're offering a, a dual membership for the price of the same as the sum of the individual ones. <coughs> um, <laughs> but we bring you these programs uh, because both organizations do really cool things. And um, really happy, again, I don't want to blow my introduction, but uh, Bethany here is a board member at Lowell's Boat Shop, and um, we're very fortunate to be here tonight. We need to thank the, the Moon for having us. Um, we need to thank James at Ipswich Ale. He's back there for mixing our drinks. Um, and I should mention that on March 7th, right, Mrs. Hoyt, yes. is our 231st birthday over at Lowell's Boat Shop. Um, and so if you did not raise your hand when I asked you if you were members of Lowell's Boat Shop, uh, you're welcome to come over on that day from 10 to 2. 10 to 2. And Mrs. Hoyt here will, uh, sorry, I call her Mrs. Hoyt. She was my high school English teacher. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Hoyt will, uh, will be there to give you a tour um, on us. So come on over. If you haven't been in a while, uh, Lowell's is a very kinetic place. We're a working museum. We do have a static historical museum in the basement, uh, but the main floor is constantly changing because we're constantly building boats, bringing them in, um, sending them out. And so, and if you come in the afternoons, what day of the week is that? Thursday. It's a Thursday. If you come after, of course, it's outside of the range I just dictated. If you come after three, um, we have a lot of kids there, a lot of apprentices there working on the boats too, which um, if you show up at three, we're not going to turn you away. Mention Michelle. 
Hmm? One of the things you can see when you go there is that we are in the process of doing a, uh, a, a light rebuild, I would call it, on the, the ship's boat for the Mayflower 2 for uh, Plymouth Patuxent Museum. So we rebuilt a, a larger boat for them a few years back, and uh, they sent us the, the smaller version, which is still pretty big for us to, um, to rebuild, and the kids are doing some of the work on that, um, using it as a teaching tool. But um, So please come join us on... Uh, on March 7th. You'll get an email anyway. It'll be all over our, our social and uh, all over our our webpage as well as the moon, right? Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, speaking of which, if if you are interested, we, you see Anne over here, we have a, a very heightened uh, presence online with our, we have a new website that's live, currently live at lowellsboatshop.org. <clears throat> so we have a little bit of a twin thing going on for a while. Um, we have a very active YouTube page now, and a very, our Instagram is also quite active. And so monthly we do video updates, a little walk around the shop, show you what's going on, and then um, some little snippets in between of things of interest. So if you haven't checked out our YouTube page, do so. We're actually live right now on our YouTube page. So you didn't have to come. You could have just been sitting home <laughs> eating pizza, <laughs> doing no the same thing. <clears throat> yeah. No free drinks from James. So, thank you all for supporting your local nonprofits. And this is a, a project that really, I was saying earlier that uh, Bethany's done all the work on and I'm going to take the credit for, but... Um, typical. Typical. Uh, <clears throat> so, I've provided the, the maritime expertise here while, uh, while Bethany has provided the historical research and the rest of the work and the place and... The drinks. And the bartender. And bartender. <laughs> um, that was a heavy lift because you had to marry him. <clears throat> um, things I do for you. Things you do for me. So uh, I know Bethany needs uh, no introduction, but uh, I'll do it anyway. So a um, uh, recent recipient of the Rising Star Award from the National Association of Historic Researchers. Uh, that's, a, that's a complete lie. Maybe <laughs> so see, we are, I told him he could say yeah. anything he wanted. You were going to get that award in the, in the mail in two days. Thank you. All right. I will. Um, but no, uh, Bethany, again, I, I don't know how she can drill down so deep on some of these historic things. <clears throat> and you'll see it tonight. Um, Bethany Groftero. Yeah. Is this awkward? That was awesome. Is this awkward here? No, it's fine. It's just don't knock my laptop okay, over. Okay, great. All right. The front is throws the seat. And this is when the karaoke begins. <laughs> All right. Well, hi, everybody. Hi. hi. I am Bethany Groftero. I am the recent winner. No, I'm, I haven't recently won anything. <laughs> but feel free to nominate me for anything that arises. Um, so uh, this has been an incredibly fun project here at the Museum of Old Newbury. I'm a relatively new... Uh, executive director here and I know a little bit about a lot and not much about anything so uh, as this project sort of developed and we'll talk about how that happened uh, I really needed to be able to talk about a very specific kind of maritime history uh, and I had I didn't have that area of knowledge and one of the beautiful things about all of the nonprofits in this area is that there is so much knowledge here and a lot of it is very specific so you know, I don't have to know everything. I just have to know who to call when I have a very specific question. And in this case, it was very specific questions about a sailing vessel um, and a particular uh, artifact. So I'm going to tell you the story of that artifact, and Graham's role in that is going to come in handy. But I'll tell you, I couldn't, we couldn't have reached this level of understanding of this artifact without Graham, and we're all very lucky to have him and Lowell's Boat Shop, and I'm very proud to be part of this community and the nonprofits here. So you should all support all of us. There's, there's enough to go around, I promise. Okay, want to cut the lights? Turn the lights down low. Okay. It's all about him, isn't it? All just, about him. <laughs> I can't see where I am. <laughs> just kidding, he, he has a speaking part, so he has to know where he's at. Okay. So... <clears throat> First, my bona fides to give this presentation. I am an inbred townie. 
I am related not only to the captain of this ship, who is James Nav Pritchard, but to his wife, Emily Goodwin. They are also related to each other. I'm also related to the cabin boy. We don't have a photograph of him, so I use the one from Master and Commander. <laughs> <laughs> My other bona fides include being a board member and unofficial secretary of Lowell's Boat Shop. It keeps me from doodling if I have to take minutes. Hot tip. I was also once rescued from a friend's pontoon boat by Graham in the Seato. <laughs> and he blew me a kiss. And all of my friends went, oh, huh. And there he is, who had a dead battery. That is the extent of my uh, boating knowledge. But I can drink, and I can, and I can read old script, and so can Graham. So we met at the Dalton Club for a... Uh, a couple of stiff drinks, and we translated the notations on the Slate Deck Log, and it has been an incredible adventure. So, what is the Slate Deck Log? And first of all, you'll see that this sold for $400. We were the only bidder. Yeah, we were the only bidder because it was misidentified, which is sort of a lucky, uh, a lucky accident. Can you all see okay? All right. Is the microphone on? No, no. It's on, but it's not. Okay, I need to just eat it while I talk? Okay. All right. Okay. On June 15th, 2023, the Museum of Old Newbury purchased a slate tablet from an auction in Cincinnati. That was part of the, uh, the key to its low price. It was on sale in Cincinnati. <laughs> not, not, very not very close to the water. Oh, I'm up the a service bit. around here is fabulous. <laughs> Can I have a drink, by the way? While I'm talking? Okay. All right, a slate of this era is common enough. Uh, it's a notebook paper sized piece of thin stone, double sided and framed in walnut. The best slate came from Pennsylvania, by the way. I now know all about slate as well. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, this, the actual slate deck log is here in this case. It's in this case because I live in fear of dumping my drink on it or sneezing or tripping, so be very careful. Um, it is a unique artifact. In an era when pa paper and ink were expensive, small portable slates were ubiquitous, the scratch paper of its time. Students used slates to copy their lessons at school. They'd take these slates home, memorize the material, and return to school with a literal blank slate. So too, slates were used to record the raw material, the wind, weather, and navigation notes that would later be transcribed into a ship's log. Whether used in the classroom or at sea, the notes kept on slate were ephemeral, meaning they, meant, they were meant to be erased shortly after they were memorized or copied down. So this is the slate deck log. It comes in a book. We've obviously opened the book. It's on both sides. Um, remember Laura Ingalls Wilder with her slate in uh, Little House on the Prairie? <coughs> so these are a couple of advertisements for slates that were in uh, the Newburyport Herald. This is from 1841, um, where uh, J.G. Tilton is offering various hardwood frame slates, also the large sizes for ship log slates. Here's another one at the bottom. Siemens journals, log slates, dividers, scales, etc. So this is, it's easy to find these objects in Newburyport. There's actually nothing unusual about a slate deck log. The thing that's unusual about this is that it is still filled out. So like most scrap paper, or actually in particular like chalkboards, which are by their uh, sort of fragile and meant to be erased, uh, that was the, the key. Why is this still filled out? And what the heck does it say? That's where Graham came in. So this one also says, uh, it's marked as My Property by James Knapp Pritchard, and it became accidentally a permanent record of the last days of his life. This is my fella, my other fella, sorry Jimmy. <laughs> Captain James Knapp Pritchard was born in Newburyport on June 11, uh, 1834. He was the eldest son of William Pritchard, who was a ship's rigger. William Pritchard's brother, Thomas Pritchard, also a sea captain, is the adopted father of John Nash Pritchard. <coughs> whose descendant is here in the room. So there's Pritchard's about. Um, and Elizabeth Hoyt Knapp, he's also related to um, Laura Coombs Hills, the painter, distantly. Both families were deeply entrenched in Newburyport's maritime economy, and it is little surprise then that James turned to the sea to make his living. He's listed as a rigger like his father at age 16 and age 21. Here on his marriage registration, if you can see, he's listed as a rigger right there. He's 21, he's marrying Emily Goodwin, who is also 21. He married her in 1856 and rose quickly through the maritime ranks. Pritchard at sea. Uh, so Captain James Pritchard went to sea 1857 on the ship Elizabeth Cushing. There are so many connections to the Cushing family of this house, it will blow your mind. 
Um, but the ship Elizabeth Cushing obviously was owned, well, maybe not obviously, but was owned by and connected to the Cushing family here. Uh, he went on the bark Hesper, Captain Smith from New York to London. 1860 to 1861, he's on the ship Fear Not, which has a lot to do with the misidentification of the slate deck log. Uh, Master T.C. Hiller, Liverpool to Boston. 1861 to 1862, he's on the ship Compass of Boston in Calcutta. So he's already been to India before he uh, goes on this fateful voyage. And he says, I love this, a hard old ship. He's describing this ship. Now what's happening in 1861, everybody? It's the Civil War, right? So this is going to also have a role in this story. So metal's hard to get. Ships are hard to get. Everything's sort of scarce. Um, 1862 to 1863, he's on the bark navigator from New York to London to Wales. So what's he transporting? You stop in Wales, you're picking up coal mm -hmm. to New York, right? Okay, now here's the, here is the dilemma, the fear not versus the fear not. The USS Fear Not was made in Newburyport, purchased by the United States Navy for service, the Union Navy, for service during the American Civil War. She was assigned to blockade duty, for, for which she was prepared with powerful guns. The Navy sold her in 1866 after the war. She was made by this spectacular gentleman, George Washington Jackman, who was a runner-up in the best beard competition of this talk. <laughs> he might be third. I think he's third. Okay. Um, so the Fear Not is actually... Uh, if you go back, this is actually his earlier vessel. He was not in command of this, but this is a different ship, the Fear Not. And um, we know this, so this is from 1861. We know this because we have the deck lot, we have the ship's journal for the Fear Not, the actual uh, ship's journal, which was kept by him when he was first mate on the Fear Not, here in the collection of the Museum of Old Newbury. We did not know that when we bought this deck log. So this is his keeping the journal of the ship Fear Not, again, 1860, 1861. So he's had this deck log. This deck log has been all over the world already by the time he takes it on this trip. Um, he became a member of the Marine Society. This is not his certificate, um, but it looked like this. Um, and he joined it in November um, 1863, age 29. So you can see here uh, that he, along with W.H. Swap. Sorry, that's a West Newbury joke. The Swap family was, anyway, do you remember the, uh, the, the steam shovel? Do you remember the, Mr. Swap in, the, in Mike Mulligan's steam shovel, who was the bad guy? That was an actual selectman in the town of West Newbury, where I'm from, and this is one of his relatives. Okay. That's like the, that's like the most local provincial thing you've ever heard in your whole life. Okay. That's right. And James K. Pritchard is right there. So he was admitted to the Marine Society. Thank goodness, because they keep good records. OK. Can I actually have a drink? I'm not joking. Can I have a drink? Uh, Mr. Yeah, she wasn't. After you talk, we <laughs> It doesn't have to have rum in it. You want to talk? It, yeah, just something, something moist. Thank you. All right. I just wanted to say the word moist on camera. OK. All right, now here we go. We're going to go down a rabbit hole here. This is the Lila Mansfield, and this is actually uh, Pritchard's first command. The Lila Mansfield is a hot mess, even for the middle of the Civil War. This is like the worst ship in the whole world. So you first discover, we have, we have the ship's journal from the Lila Mansfield, also in the collection of the Museum of Old Newbury. If you look at the bottom of this list, you see it says, a survey has been held on board the ship Lila Mansfield before reportedly put back to Swan Point. This is in Maryland, and she was pronounced seaworthy. Well, she's fine. Notwithstanding the decision of the surveyors, the crew still refused to go to sea in her. <laughs> Two extra hands were shipped, and a policeman put on board to go as far as the Capes, and the ship again started on her voyage. So nobody will get on this ship without a police escort. <laughs> uh, second indication of strife, uh, former mariners of the Lila Mansfield in Boston are, sh are suing the captain for damages, meaning there's been a certain amount of unpleasantness aboard the Lila Mansfield. Um, and actually he sails out as the first mate on this ship in 1863, and um, by May he is the captain. This is his first command, the disastrous, leaky, old Lila Mansfield. <laughs> Um, but he seems to be pretty proud of himself. Ship Lila Mansfield, J.K. Pritchard. That's the first time his name appears with Master next to it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Can you find a resting place for that? I got one right. All right. Okay. So 
So we're very proud of him. And then he sank it. <clears throat> On July 21st, 1864, uh, Pritchard sinks uh, the Lila Mansfield off the coast of Ireland as she's sailing to Liverpool. Uh, the ship Lila Mansfield from St. Stephen to Liverpool with deals. This is where Graham comes in extremely handy because I'm like, deals? Like, let's make a deal? Like, are there unmarked prizes on board this? A deal is lumber, I guess. It's sort of boring. And then Graham was like, well, that's why she didn't sink. She just sat there and they got all the lumber off her. Like, how would you know these things? We've got to have a friend like Graham. Okay. Cargo's discharging under the inspection of Lloyd's agent. Again, so that she's just floating around. She's full of lumber. All right. Water, apparently. Yes, oh, and she was um, near Tusker Light. Tusker Light is a notoriously dangerous point off Ireland, and this is Tusker Light. That's where she sank. And he, in his journal, wrote a long explanation of why he just sunk his brand new ship, which I do not expect you to read, but it's pretty cool. He, taught, he basically, this is, actually, this is a good example of what goes in the smooth log or the final log, right? The handwriting's good, nothing's crossed out. He's got his, like, thoughts correct. You know, he's, he's like the pumps. We're full of water, and you know the seas were heavy. We could do nothing to save the ship, and escaped in the in the boats. The masts were going to go by the boards. He's got he's got all. This is an insurance document for a, a captain, right? He's got it all worked out. Meanwhile, back in Newburyport, John Newmarch Cushing Jr., who lived here in this very house and is the father of our beloved Margaret Cushing, who lived in this house from 1855 to 1955. That's her dad. Um, he had ordered a grand new ship, the Elcano, who was named after the Castilian navigator, best known for having actually, not Magellan, completed the first circumnavigation of the Earth. Thank you very much. That's the Elcano. In 1522, the Elcano was ship number 74 to be built by the courier shipyard, and supplies were purchased as early as February 1864. And you can see... Here, this is the first order. Now, the uh, Peabody Essex Museum, I'm sorry, I know it's hard to see in the back, but the Peabody Essex Museum has all of the building records for the Courier Shipyard. And so we can see in February, on February 19th, 1864, uh, bought of Fuller and Dana the bolt iron for ship number 74, which is the Elcano, it's not named yet, um, at $104 per ton. And the spikes, etc. So that's the first order for this ship. That's the Courier Shipyard. Weirdly enough, I don't have a good picture of it. If any of you have a good photograph of the John Courier <laughs> Jr. Shipyard, I'd love it. We have every other shipyard, like 400 pictures of them. Not this one. Uh, but we have all the records. We know exactly how the Elcona was made, how many chains, how many chairs, how many sofas. It's amazing. Uh, we have the final bill, and this is the guy that made it. This is John James Courier, uh, the father of the historian Courier, for those of you who uh, are big fan, super fans of local historians, right? All of you? Yeah, okay. And the vessel was officially added. It's 1,210 tons built by John Currier and owned by Mr. John and William Cushing and Nicholas Johnson, okay? So that's one of the bigger ships that's sailing actually at the time. Okay, so <clears throat> once completed and ready for sale, the Elcano arrived in Boston by November 20th when the Boston Post noted her arrival to load for the East Indies. She began running advertisements for passengers and cargo, um, headed for Gaul, which is present-day Sri Lanka. It's in Ceylon at the time, so you can see the new ship Elcano is um, taking freight or passengers. And then you can see here, this is sort of how you follow a ship through the paper, right? Um, there's no photographs of this ship, no paintings, and no official documents. So this is all reliant on sort of uh, against the grain research, uh, trying to find other things, because um, the official files are not there. Okay, so you can see in Boston, the uh, cleared on the 17th, the ship Elcano. So the Elcano um, clears for shipping on the 17th of December. And then you can see down here, sailed the ship Elcano, all right? So you can see, arrived in Boston, got some freight, got cleared to sail, sailed, sailed on the 20th. And that's where the story begins. Actually, the plot thickens. Mr. Nesbitt, do you have something to say? I do. Thank you Reverend so H.S. Nesbitt, I'm trying to get in touch with someone who might be able to give me any information about the ship Elcano, built at Newburyport and making her maiden voyage from Boston to India, sailing December 17, 1864. She was commanded by Captain James K. Pritchard, and he was lost overboard in a storm three days out from Boston, December 20th. It occurs to me that if Captain Pritchard was a resident of Newburyport, some member of his family might still be there, 
a son or grandson, who would have some record of the event. The reason for my inquiry is that I am preparing to re republish a book written by Dr. Samuel Henry Kellogg, who with his wife and Mr. and Mrs. Myers was sailing on the Elcano to India as young missionaries. When the commander was lost in the storm, the crew proposed to mutiny and bring the vessel back to Boston. But Dr. Kellogg, who had studied navigation, was given the charts and instruments and brought the vessel safely to Ceylon. Not totally true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Nesbitt, carry on. It is to, if possible, learn further about this voyage that I am making the above inquiry. I will thank you if from Newburyport you could send me any data about the Elcano or about Captain Pritchard. Thank you very much, Mr. Quigley. This is what you have to do when you're the president of my board. <laughs> Read long passages out loud. So as we're doing the research on this uh, ship log, which we've obviously been the only bidder on and purchased in uh, Cincinnati, uh, it turns up in 1941 that somebody is looking for information about this ship. This would be fairly dull, sorry, excellently read, but a fairly dull entry, except it tells you that there are missionaries on board. And if I know one thing about missionaries, I know they like to talk about themselves. <laughs> right? Am I right? Am I right? Are any of you Protestant missionaries? Any of you? Okay, because they don't come out looking great at the end of the story. Okay. All right. I was raised by born again Christians, so I feel like I have a little bit of I have a little bit of play here. All right. I have some bona fides. I will not show you a picture of me in church, but I do have the, I do have those bona fides. So, uh, Dr. Samuel Henry Kellogg piqued my interest. So this sent me to Dr. Henry Kellogg, who not only kept a journal and letters, but they're published. It's so beautiful. He was on this boat, and he is an eyewitness not only to the death of the captain, but to everything that happens on the ship. So that is an incredible first-person record when you don't have any other um, official records for this ship. Now, funnily enough, Harry Bailey answered him in the newspaper shortly after Harry Bailey's father compiled the records of the Newburyport Marine Society and quoted from that. This led me on another bit of a, this is my Where's Waldo, because Captain Bailey, uh, in his obituary, it says he leaves two sons, Frank Bailey and Harry Bailey, and a daughter, Mrs. Eben Bradbury of the city. You may or may not know that I wrote a book about Eben Bradbury. This is his mother, so this is his grandfather. Anyway, so... He pops up. I always like to show a picture of him. He died in World War I. There's a book about him upstairs. You should read it. It's good. <laughs> hey, buddy. All right. Back to the 19th century. OK, so now, because there were missionaries on board, and missionaries like to talk about themselves, we know who is on board. Here's the cast assembled. The ship's company, Captain James Knapp and Emily Goodwin Pritchard, as you know. Oh, wait, his wife's on board. How do we know that? Because the missionary said so. He said, she's crying a lot. Maybe she should pray more. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, Mr. Sheffield, first mate and interim captain. He's awesome. I would love to know more about him. He's sort of a blank slate. Uh, there's a second mate. There's a steward. There's a carpenter. There's one white boy. Wait, what? <laughs> Do you know what that means? Everybody else isn't. Everybody else is black. Yeah. This is an all-black crew except for this one white boy, which it turns out is verified later on. But why would that be? Middle of the Civil War, yeah. right? Okay. Uh, Presbyterian missionaries, Samuel Henry Kellogg and Antoinette, or Nettie Kellogg, and Mr. and Mrs. Myers. I have to say, Mrs. Myers comes out looking like a rose. She takes very good care of the cabin boy. I'll tell you how I know that later. <laughs> uh, not in a weird way. She gives them oranges. Come on now. All right. And then there's Free Will Baptist missionaries who didn't know that the Presbyterians were going to be on board. So now we've got... <laughs> Free Will Baptist missionaries, oh and we have Presbyterian missionaries, and they're not totally psyched to be on the ship together. They're on competing missions in India. So that's Dr. Lowry and H.C. Phillips and Mary Phillips, daughters Julia and Ida. They end up teaming up because everybody's throwing up, and the only people not throwing up are Samuel Henry Kellogg and daughter Julia, so they end up dealing with the vomiters, um, which brings people together in extremis, right? We've all, we all went to college, not yet. So, so, so we know how that goes. Okay. So Samuel K Kellogg did write copiously. We have the eyewitness account. We know that the captain's wife was on board. This is the, uh, the cast assembled. All right. Uh, let's go to... This is what this mission looked like from the uh, position, the point of view of the missionaries before they left. Sierra? Oh, we look at 
that group on the Alcana with an interest and anxiety quite inexpressible. We rehearse not their sacrifices. We have no tears of pity. They have repudiated them beforehand. Rather, we would rather would we envy them their lot. The work is so noble, the reward so rich in bounties. On then, brave Elcano, dare wind and wave, for God is with thee. The prayers of the church, thy sheet anchor, and hope thy pennant. On, for perishing millions await thy coming in the land of death shades. Really? On then, and still on, right bravely, for thy swift keel and strong ribs and beautiful prow and sure helm, all thy planks below and all thy spreading canvas above shall be morning and evening committed in devout prayer to the safe keeping of him who rules the seas. They are a bundle of laughs, <laughs> these people. All right, so I just made Sierra read that because I had to read books of this to find these records. Okay. So they're all, this is, that's what they thought was going to happen. So, December 17th to, to the 19th, it's, the ship is laying in Boston Harbor. And we've got another missionary on board. This one doesn't even go on the voyage, but she's got some things to say. She's an eyewitness. Sierra? Saturday, December 17th, found the missionary party on board the Elcano. Captain Pritchard, happy that the hour had come to which they had been looking forward for years. The Elcano was a new, splendid ship with fine accommodations. Its pleasant, gentlemanly captain had been recently married and his wife was accompanying him. Four Presbyterian missionaries were fellow passengers. The writer, with some other friends, was permitted to accompany them in the ship to the place of anchorage in the river and return in the tug steamer. On account of forbidding weather, they remained at the anchorage till the following Tuesday before putting out to sea. Thank you. So from that, we learn a lot about what the ship is, what these people think of the ship, and we learn that the weather's bad, and it is at the anchorage until the following Tuesday. It was meant to go earlier. This is from the scintillating M.M. Hutchins Hills uh, with her brief seller, her, her bestseller, A Brief History of the Free Baptist India Mission and the Elcano. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, she got on board because the Free Will Baptists, Mary Phillips and her husband, uh, were on board, and guess what? They also kept diaries. We have ended up with so many eyewitnesses to this, to this voyage. It's crazy. They keep popping up, which I think is pretty cool. I, I tend to pay attention when these people sort of come back up and ring your bell. So, Mary Phillips, what do you have to say, Mary? We went to board the Elcano, a new sailing vessel bound for the then distant Orient, laden with ice. What an icy day it was. Mass and rigging glistened with icicles. The poor sailors came from aloft with your ears and toes frozen. Thank you very much, Mrs. White. <laughs> the next day, Saturday, December 18th, 1864. By the way, he's a cabin boy. He kept a journal. We have it in our collection. We had no idea because it was filed under the ship Eleanor, which no <laughs> such ship exists. It's the Elcano. I almost passed out. <laughs> I really actually almost passed out. First of all, there are no journals kept by cabin boys. None. I mean, there's probably one or two. There are none from Newburyport that are, are known. He's 16. He's the one white boy. And we have his entire journal of this voyage. Yeah, it blows my mind. Okay, where is uh, William Weston Creasy? Got up early and went to work. The first time I ever worked on Sunday, we cleared the snow off the decks, and by noontime, we had it all done. So we had the afternoon. I wrote a letter home to send by the shipkeeper, went out and furled the flying jib, and went up on the royal yard. Thank you, my friend. He became my very, very, very favorite. He was a little <clears throat> sweetie pie, little 16-year-old homesick boy. So he pairs up with Mrs. Myers, who feels sort of sorry for him and keeps giving him oranges. <laughs> it's all very above board. OK. <laughs> and now we have Dr. Uh, Samuel Kellogg. What do you have to say? Well, after enjoying my cornflakes, <laughs> <laughs> well, about our voyage, after so many delays waiting in Boston all day Sabbath, Monday morning we went down to the wharf. Through a drenching rain and over a rough water, we were taken in a rowboat to the Elcano lying in the bay. Nettie, they lashed into a chair and hoisted up the <laughs> ship's side. Mrs. Myers, not liking that style, climbed up the ladder. 
<laughs> Isn't that amazing? Just the detail in that. And of course, he's like, I don't know, the ship was just sitting there all day Sunday. The cabin boy's like, yeah, I worked my butt off all day <laughs> on the Sabbath. Okay. Oh, look at that. Oh. Wait a minute. I'm going to go back for a minute and tell you a little bit about Samuel Henry Kellogg, and then I'm going to turn this over to my cohort, my, my colleague here. Samuel Henry Kellogg was the son of a Presbyterian minister from Long Island. Six, 1864 had been a banner year. He completed his studies at the Princeton Theological Seminary, and a lifelong dream was realized when on April 20th he was ordained a missionary to India by the Presbytery of Hudson, New York. Then on, in May, he married school teacher Antoinette Hartwell, called Nettie, and hoisted up in a chair by her new husband. <clears throat> Kellogg had spent time in New England. He attended Williams College in his youth, and after a summer and fall furiously fundraising all over the place, he set off for Boston with Nettie and booked passage <clears throat> for, to India on the Elcano. Now we're going to talk about the deck log. Oh, over to you, Graham. Over to me. Hi, everybody. Here I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Do you have pictures of the deck log? Or is this where I'm working from? Um, no, you just hit the clicker. Oh, look at this. Great. Don't look. Let me see what's ahead. Okay, well, <laughs> we're going to work from this, uh, but we'll come back to this. But we're basically, uh, the ship's log in general is, is the, well, this one in particular being the deck log is the rough runnings of the ship. It would be copied fair into a uh, smooth log. Um, and some things, you know, might change in between. Things the insurance company didn't want to hear might be eliminated. Um, but it's, it's basically a, a blow by blow of what's going on. And in this particular case, there are some inconsistencies with the dates. And when, if you look at uh, the track line of the ship and where it's going, it, it seems to make a lot of distance in a very short amount of time. And in some cases, no distance in a very long amount of time. And so um, I think the timeline on the deck log itself is a little funky, but um, the, the, the basics are all there. But um, he refers to a lot of the, the sales by name and we can come back to this if you really want the, the rundown, but the, the basic working of a square rigged ship like this, and this was a, a ship rigged ship, which means it had square sails on all three masts. Um, and basically speaking, the, the lower one here is the course. You see the main course, the mizzen course. Uh, in this case, this ship had split topsails, meaning it had an upper and lower topsail, which was a, a bit of a modern thing at that point in 1864. So you see an upper topsail, lower topsail, a Tagallant, and then a Royal, so that's where this young lad climbed to the, it didn't have anything above, um, so he climbed to the tallest part of the mainmast on his Sabbath day. Um, but all these sails are, you've got coarse, lower topsail, upper topsail, Tagallant, Royal. These would all be main, what have you. On this mast, they'd all be four, what have you, and then mizzen, you know, all those same sails. Um, the spanker is a bit of an oddity, that's the one uh, back aft down here. And then you've got your jibs, um, a staysail, inner, outer, and flying. And that's basically your, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, see, you see how I need it, yeah. Graham. There are some staysails in there, but uh, we don't need to worry about those right now. Um, so looking at this deck log, it's incredibly difficult to read. If you think about yourself taking notes, you're writing things in your own shorthand that you know you're going to go back to later. Um, in this case, it was the same sort of thing. Also, anyone that's tried to write with chalk knows it's difficult, and anyone that's tried to write with chalk uh, on a chalkboard that's got a little uh, frame around it, you know, you get to the end, and it gets hard to write. And so all the stuff over here gets a little funky to, to write as well. So, um, and then we're missing, we're missing whatever happened down there. That all's, all's kind of gone. So um, this was actually, I loved it when, when Bethany called me and told me that she had this, and... Uh, that we get to look at this in person and try to decipher what it all meant. What's next? You read from the sheet. This thing. There. Great. Right. You're going to tell them what it So says. what this says, as far as we can tell, uh, 20 December 1864, at wharf, which we already kind of know is wrong since everyone said the ship's out at anchor in the harbor. So when getting underway, if you were fully loaded, what would happen is you would either warp out, or in this case, they had a tug take them out off the off the wharf, you'd get away from the dock and anchor in the stream, meaning out in the harbor. You'd wait for the fair wind or a fair tide or both. Um, it was much easier to get underway from the anchor. You'd haul up your anchor and off you'd go. So <clears throat> um, took the pilot aboard at 3 a.m. It's all up here if you read it. 
at 3 a.m., um, hauled up and got underway. So the pilot came on board, who a pilot is someone that you take on board who knows the channels, knows the harbor, and is going to see you out safely um, in tight quarters. And so whenever you leave a port or come into a port, you, you bring a pilot with you to leave, and then you get somewhere else, and you take that local pilot on, and they get you into the wharf safely. So in this case, the pilot came aboard at 3 a.m., must have been awfully cold and awfully dark at 3 a.m. in December. Mm. <clears throat> got underway at 4.30, so as soon as the pilot came on board, he got the crew going. They started to haul the anchor back um, and get going. There's a lot buried and got underway at 4.30. They hauled the anchor up. They got sails on the ship, got sailing out the, out the harbor. Uh, past the outer light, which is Boston Light. If you've been to Boston, you know it's the big white one with the, the five circles on it. Um, blowing fresh from the northwest, which is a very fair breeze for leaving Boston Harbor. Setting the mainsail and lower main topsail, halyard parted. So this is a brand new ship. It sailed down from Newburyport to Boston to load, but that was about as much of a shakedown cruise as it would have had. And with a new ship like this, uh, a lot of the kinks haven't been worked out yet. Some of the rigging could be run wrong. Um, and even at this time, it's a little bit dangerous being on a new ship because the, the standing rigging will stretch and the rig will loosen up as you're in a seaway. And sometimes if you can't get it tightened up in time, you'll lose the masts. Um, so in this case, something was clearly wrong. And as they were uh, setting the the lower main topsail, which you would haul that yard up the mast to set the sail, the halyard parted and it came down on top of the, the lower mast. And let's see, it bended bending the main shroud down, splitting the top rim. So it did some damage to the upper part of that lower mast. They didn't set, turn back, they just kept going. They would have repaired that at sea. <clears throat> After passing the outer light, no signs of the station boat coming here. So that pilot doesn't want to go to Calcutta. <laughs> <clears throat> Typically, uh, in all weathers, at all times of year, there's a pilot boat going back and forth, usually um, <laughs> maybe close in between, you know, Salem and Situate, or further out between Gloucester and Cape Cod, looking for ships coming in to put a pilot aboard or looking for outgoing ships to drop the pilot off um, and take them back to Boston. In this case, they couldn't see the station boat. Um, to the northward, and again, it, we're trying to interpret what's written here, which is not terribly easy. Um, to the northward, and then at 9 a.m., wore around other tack. So, anybody here a sailor? So you tack a ship. Well, that was very few hands. Great. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it way back down. Uh, when, you, when you tack a ship, uh, you bring the bow of the ship through the wind. It's very safe, typically. On a square rig ship, it's not the easiest thing to do, especially when it's uh, fairly breezy. So... Uh, and it requires a ship to have a lot of momentum and requires pretty exact timing for the crew to get the, the sails around. This being a new ship, probably a new crew, they weren't terribly well trained, I have to imagine. And so to wear a ship, you go, instead of going, we'll call it 100 degrees through the wind, you go 260 degrees the other way, so you turn off the wind, bring the stern through the wind, and come back up and head out the other way. So that's what they did here, which is a much safer thing to do oftentimes on a square rig ship. You just tend to lose a lot of ground. So they wore um, ship, then they wore around again, and finally saw a, a cruising party off of Baker's Island, which is up near Salem Sound, put the pilot aboard um, that ship, and then they were free to go. So they headed off, um, kept course southeast, 1 p.m., 1 PM made the race, bearing southeast 12 miles, the race being the tip of Cape Cod. So they could see it was 12 miles off. Um, is that like race point? Is that yep. Yep. And Cape Cod's pretty hard to see when you're out there because it doesn't, you know, it's pretty low. Um, from experience, I can tell you when you're sailing from Gloucester to Cape Cod, the first thing you see is the Pilgrim Monument, a little stick sticking up. Mm -hmm. And then you have to get pretty close before you start to see actual Cape Cod. Jimmy's next. To the next slide. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jimmy, what's happening? Yeah. Well, this is according to what the missionaries say. <laughs> <laughs> Rose at 1 a.m. to see the ship off. It took some time to get her to the wind and start her, but at last, at 3.17 in the morning, we moved from moorings 
and had left America for India. We were delayed some hours by waiting for the pilot boat to take the pilot off outside the harbor. Since 9 or 10 this morning, however, we've been moving rapidly first east, then south-southeast, until now we are far out of sight of land, 350 <laughs> miles, the captain tells me, from the coast of New Jersey. He's from New York, so there's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> New York, yeah, New Jersey. a little bit of a waste. You can go to the next one. Next slide. The next day. Okay, the next day. Wednesday, December 21st. Uh, 2.45 p.m., which just before this talk, we deliberated and thought this could perhaps be a.m., considering how fast they were moving and where they are now. Um, Highland Light for west-southwest, four miles distance, meaning they're around Cape Cod. Highland Light is in Truro, um, and so it's, it's bearing west-southwest from the ship, so they're east-northeast of it, um, four miles off the beach, which is pretty close. And the only thing, the only reason you would be that close to land is if the wind was blowing you offshore, which it was blowing northwest. Uh, an hour and 15 minutes later, 4 p.m. Highland Light bearing northwest by west, so they've passed Highland Light and now it's sort of behind them. Stiff breeze from the northwest, all first and middle watches. So uh, first and middle watches, that's the, the first watch would be 8 p.m. to midnight, middle watch would be midnight to 4. Morning watch, it died away, hauling to the southward. So the wind dies and comes ahead because they're trying to head south, which you can't head straight into the wind in a sailing ship. Um, light breeze till noon. Noon when freshening, in royal and main top gallant sails. So when it went light, they started to set all the sails to try to make way. And now that the wind is starting to blow, they're starting to take them in, starting with the uppermost, the royal and to gallants. So... Typically speaking, uh, you would start from the top and work down as the breeze started to blow, or you'd also take in the courses aren't very, aren't very good in a heavy breeze as well. The last thing you would take in are the topsails. Um, tacked ship to the southward, heading up south-southwest. So they're actually headed in toward the beach, um, in toward land, south-southwest, 2 p.m. of the 23rd into gallants, so there's the wind is freshening and they're taking in more sail. 4 p.m., uh, flying jib lost, so it's the outer jib potentially blew out. <clears throat> Again, brand new ship, brand new sails. I'd want, I'd, I'd call warranty on that. <laughs> um, Sorry, courier. <laughs> yeah, took so upper good. and four mizzen topsail. 5 p.m. in upper main topsail and mainsail. So again, still striking sail, the wind's building um, in main top staysail. Jib and spanker hauled up, so it's getting real bad. Um, oh, sorry, in jib and spanker and hauled up foresail, blowing a gale wind. So what's left? Uh, four topsails. <laughs> uh, 8 p.m., Moderating and shifting into the westward, warship and kept her course southeast a half east. 9 p.m. set foresail, so the wind's dropping, so now we're setting more sail again. Last celestial sight, 6 p.m., 40, uh, 40 degrees, 44 north, 70, 38 west. So here you go. Oh, this have a little pointer on it? It does. It's this right, the red button right there. Cool. All right, so we're leaving Boston. We got a northeast breeze. Out we come, blah, blah, blah. There's no pilot boat, so what do we have to do? We got to head north up here off of Baker's. We drop the pilot off, and we have a fair breeze, which blows us all the way out here to the Cape. These are those two um, sightings of the, the lighthouse of Highland Light. Again, the dates are maybe a little off, and then they're coming down here, and the wind gets a little, a little light, and they start to uh, make sail and then strike sail. And then all the way down here, those are the last numbers that I just read off to you, which is uh, the last sight before this captain goes overboard. Which incidentally is uh, you're just south of George's Bank here and you're getting off of the continental shelf and into where the Gulf Stream would start to take effect, which is not unusual that you start to see heavier seas down there, especially if the, the winds were, had been blowing or were about to blow. All right, back to me. Back to you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It's like a whole other language. 
And I could have probably figured out what those words said to some extent, but I never would be able to tell that kind of a story. That to me is an incredible gift. So thank you very much for doing that. That was awesome. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. No, really, for somebody to be able to look at what's on that and say, oh, I know what that captain was doing is amazing. I just got tingles. I love it. It's a wonderful gift to somebody that reads those things and like has to look up. Oh, wait, which one was the topsail again? It's different than when you're not just on your friend's pontoon boat, but actually you sailed boat. <laughs> okay. So uh, back to the Presbyterian missionaries, because they have a lot to say. What's Mr. Kellogg talking about on December 21st? Ah. Uh. It seemed as if the whole sea were rolling down upon us. Think of mountains of water sweeping and roaring continuously over the deck, often five or six feet of water, so that nothing of the ship was visible but the masts. The hatchway to the cabin was torn away the first night and thundered about the deck in an awful manner. Large spare masts and spars, lashed to the deck with ropes and chains, broke their fastenings and were tossed about like chips. Yeah, so this is what's happening right after that last um, sighting in the deck log. All right, what does the, ba the Free Will Baptist missionary say? Well, on Thursday morning, our noble Captain Pritchard passed out of the cabin with his pleasant good morning. And in one minute more, one of those mountain-like waves swept over the deck and the startling cry went up from one end of the vessel to the other. Captain's overboard! The cry reached the ear of his poor wife, still in bed. And for a time, she seemed almost beside herself. We prayed and talked with her till she became calm. But our good captain could not be rescued. Every man seemed terror-stricken, and all that could be done was to square the yards and let the ship drive before the gale, as this was our only chance for safety. The storm raged with unabated violence four days and nights. Yeah, so this is uh, the morning of the 22nd. I, I'm going to really, I'm going to suggest that the captain did not leave his cabin and say a, fa a cheerful good morning, <laughs> because according to his wife, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning, and he hasn't slept since the ship left Boston. So let's, uh, let's see who we're going to hear from next. So many missionaries to choose from. Oh, let's go back to Samuel Kellogg. All right. <laughs> Thursday morning, while the storm was raging furiously and the sea sweeping over the decks, our captain was out attending to the workings of the pumps. A, a heavy wave came six feet high over the bulwarks and took him instantly from the cabin door over the high bulwark on the opposite into the sea. He was seen for an instant battling the surge, but no more. We could do nothing to save him. The sea was fearful. No boat could live for an instant. No rope could be thrown, for we were driving at a furious rate before the wind and were instantly far away from him. The ship could not be put about, for that would have been instant destruction to us all. The hands at the pumps only saved by themselves by springing into the rigging and the first mate by swimming. This is kind of, I mean, again, this is a horrible tragedy, but how amazing to have all of these eyewitnesses to this, right? This is all from this one little deck log. Enter Emily Goodwin Pritchard. This is actually her cousin Lydia, because we don't have a photo of her, but they're the same age. So there you go. We'll extrapolate from that. Uh, Emily Goodwin Pritchard is not only on board the Elcano, she has a diary, and the Custom House had the diary. Turns out we also have a copy of the diary, but I went to the Custom House and they dug this up. This has been a real community effort. Uh, so Emily Goodwin, what's going on with you? Little did I think when I left home that I should be called to mourn the death of my dear husband so soon as this, but it is so. After leaving Boston, we had a very severe gale and the ship being overloaded was very hard to manage, with the sea breaking over her continually. On Thursday morning, December 22nd, my dear husband was swept overboard by a fearful sea breaking over the ship. He had been on deck nearly all night and had not been in the cabin more than an hour when he arose and thought he would go on deck and see what he could do. He had not been out more than five minutes when I heard the cry, The captain is overboard! Oh, shall I ever forget that cry? My dear husband gone, and how can I think that I shall ever see him again? Can you even imagine? All right. 
Okay, so Captain Sheffield, I also have no picture of him, don't even know his first name. So we're just going to assume. So uh, Sheffield, the first mate who saved himself by swimming, is now the captain. And uh, he, he, he's not universally loved by the missionaries on board. So we start off, you know, trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. So uh, Kellogg says, he's quite without the refinement of, and culture of the captain. This is his first note on, our, on Sheffield. Then he says, our commander's a bitter hatred of Christianity. <laughs> bitter hater of Christianity. Uh, and then the other, the Free Will Baptist missionary, Mary, says, we are without a pilot or any competent officer. <clears throat> then Samuel Henry Kellogg ranches, ramps it up a bit and says, he's a very bad man, underlined, awfully profane, passionate, and cruel. And at the end, uh, by the end of the journey, he said, he is more like a demon of the infernal pit than a human being. <laughs> These are all direct quotes about the new captain of the ship, <laughs> Mr. Sheffield. And then here comes William W. Creasy. Turns out William W. Creasy, 16-year-old from Newburyport, kept a journal, again, unheard of, and wrote, it is the sweetest thing. He, is, he observes everything he tells you when he washes his drawers. He spells them draws. He said, I, he said, I'll take I, I promised mother I'd wash my drawers, he says at one point. And he and a whole bunch of the crew go up and like get, get a hose on the pumps and give themselves baths, which, I don't know, sounds weird or awesome, depending on your perspective. So he, uh, he's, a, he's an interesting perspective there. Okay, so this is, what Sam, this, is, this is not awesome. Samuel Henry Kellogg is not, he is a, uh, uh, a broad-minded individual. This is what he has to say about the crew. I've not told you much about our crew. A remarkable lot they are of almost every other color but white. Only one white boy among them. They profess to be Negroes all, but are yellow, olive, black, and mahogany variously. This is the nicest passage. <laughs> they are from the Canary Islands and Puerto Rico, some of them, and speak not a word of English, but a jargon of Negro Portuguese and Negro Spanish. Others are contrabands from Maryland and Virginia. It's the middle of the Civil War. Some are intelligent enough, a wild, grotesque-looking set they are. Now, I would not quote that, except this is an eyewitness account of an all-black crew during the Civil War. It's a pretty amazing record. And in fact, he, um, in a very sort of uh, insulting way, but it's also incredible, writes down the songs they're singing or his version of what he's hearing them singing. He says that they all come on board without names, which is obviously nonsense. They all have names, but they're given names, some of them because they're escaped and they maybe don't want to use their real names, some of them because they want to adopt a new identity. And also a bunch of them because that's what you do on a ship, right? You give everybody a weird nickname. Absolutely. What's your weird nickname? Tugboat. Tugboat. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. That is not a picture of the crew. So now they're at sea from December 20th to May 17th. Uh, so this is a long voyage, December to May, 1864 to 1865. So I'm not going to go through everything they did at sea, but I can tell you I could do a day by day, blow by blow. There's a, did a lot of reading about what people do at sea. They caught a lot of albatross. They caught a bunch of porpoises. Uh, they saw blackfish. They fought. They but a lot of what they did was pray. Anybody want to talk about praying? Who's got my praying witness statement? Is it you? Are you praying? I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Pritchard, our captain's widow, is in a very anxious state of mind. I had a very satisfactory talk with her two or three days ago and thinks she is not far from, if not already, in the kingdom of God. That miserable Amer Armenian doctrine and their whole story of talk is very bad for such a one. It drives them to scrutinize their own experiences and feelings instead of turning them away from self to Christ. Thank you, Mr. Kellogg. So basically he's saying, um, she thinks about, she's, she, she might be saved, she's thinking about herself a lot in this whole experience, because the Armenian style of doctrine is the Baptists on board, who, you know, they, anyway, it's a, it's a complicated religious situation, but <laughs> essentially he says over and over again, she'd feel much better if she'd stop crying and pray more. <laughs> Okay, they also were doing a certain amount of vomiting. Anyone, anyone vomiting? Okay. Vomiting. It was a wonderful thing that through it all, I had not a qualm of sickness, an exemption only shared by Julia Phillips. The other eight were desperately seasick. Half of the ship's crew were laid up at the beginning frozen solid. Miss Julia and I had to do everything in the cabin. 
nurse our eight sick, lift them around, make their beds, etc. I have done about every kind of work commonly done by women. <laughs> I have gone through wonderfully well, worked very hard, slept very little, kept up good spirits, only feel a little worn and exhausted. I was pitched about the cabin in the gale. The rest laugh at me, but these are scars of honor. They were not knocked about only because they were too sick to be out of their berths. <laughs> That's Mr. Kellogg. He's my favorite. He, he kept the most detailed record, so we hear a lot from him. Um, and fighting. We're fighting. Let's, let's fight. The subordinate officers and some or all of the crew were much dissatisfied with the first mate on his, on his accession to command, displeased with his plans, and finally threatened mutiny. So fighting appears in all the records. The crew is fighting with the captain. The uh, passengers are fighting with the captain. Uh, they're also uh, complaining about being thirsty. <laughs> Anyone got that one? Who wants to read about water? We have it over here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is by way of perspective, not only on how awful water can be on board ship, but make you grateful for whatever comes out of the spigot in your own place. <laughs> <laughs> Complaining about being thirsty. We are troubled at present with bad water. We had splendid arrangements for water when we left Boston a large tank filled with water and embedded in ice, which would give us the best of water. But the careless scamps whose business it was did not make the covering of it on deck watertight, so that in the storm, the sea water washed in so that it will not quench the risk by making it very brackish and most unpleasant. The casks that we have been using have no water, but of the most vile taste. They say after two or three weeks, fermenting it will be sweet. <laughs> for this we must wait. It is really amusing to see the right faces and woeful expressions of our poor company, as from time to time they try to force down the nauseous draft. We put all manner of curious things into it. Raspberry vinegar, molasses, vinegar, boiled cider, wine, brandy, cream of tartar, but nothing will quite cover the taste of the rigging in old casks, though they render it somewhat more tolerable. We have some canned pineapples with very little sugar in them, the liquor from which is about the best substitute we find for water, a teaspoonful at a time. Well done, Alex. Thank you very much. I love that. Okay. And uh, being lost. <laughs> Anyone got the record of being lost? These are themes that appear in everybody's recollections of this voyage. Monday, April 24th. Rainy all day. I did a little washing in the morning. Mr. Kellogg was looking over the charts today and found that Mr. Sheffield had taken the wrong course. He had been told of it before, but would not listen to it. He thought he knew best and was confident that he was right, but today he was glad to put back. That will detain us two or three weeks longer. That is from the captain's wife. Uh, there are other records here that prove that she also didn't trust the first mate, uh, which I think is key to the survival of the deck log because she seemed to have taken all the captain's books, instruments, and a, you know presumably his deck log as well and kept them with her. Um, but he had his own. They, the first mate would have had his own deck log. He would have had his own instruments uh, as well. So anyway, Mr. Kellogg decided that he had gone. They were sort of becalmed and they had gone the wrong way. So that's how they spent their voyage. Now, uh, this is a funny little record here. Uh, this is the, so they've been gone for a month. This is January 26th. This gives their latitude and longitude. Uh, so two days out of port, the morning of the third day, Captain Pritchard goes overboard and dies. His wife is on this ship for five months without him. Now, why didn't they just turn around? They've got a cargo of ice. It's December. They're on a schedule. They need to get there. But the first mate is sort of browbeaten into agreeing that if they stop and speak a, sh a homegoing ship, meaning they make contact with a homegoing ship. They'll put her on the homegoing ship and then they'll carry on. What ends up happening is that he just never, he will never stop. He doesn't stop to talk to any ships because he wants to get to Calcutta and get paid. Um, so on January 26th, there's like a distant ship, uh, the American ship Arminius, and the newspaper says 37 days from Boston for Calcutta, then they figure out probably ship Elcano Pritchard from Boston December 20th for Gaul and Calcutta. So they've run into this ship, they've yelled at each other from a distance, and the Elcano keeps going, they figure out that it's him. He may have given the false name for the ship. I don't know. 
But anyway, nobody still knows the captain's dead. Nobody in Newburyport knows that this has happened. All right, finally, May 17th, 1865, they get to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. What does Samuel Henry Kellogg have to say about that? We sighted Ceylon yesterday morning. Uh, shore densely wooded with cocoa trees and palm. This morning at 10, we sighted Gaul. There are pagodas, minarets, and domes, uh, Mohammedan mosques and temples, and groves of cocoa and palm. Cocoa and palm mean a theme. <laughs> the harbor pilot has come on board. His boat, an extraordinary craft, very long, and only wide enough for one man to sit in. The bottom, a log hollowed out, the, uh, the top just like a narrow box, the prow very high. On one side, two sticks project ten feet over which a cross piece is fastened so that this frame just floats. It is to keep the boat from capsizing. Thank you very much, sir. Well written. Well read. Okay, uh, where's, where's our cabin boy? <clears throat> the land is pretty high along the shore, covered with cocoa and trees. And back in the country, you can see a high ridge of mountains. We ran in pretty close and then ran down the coast. Pretty soon, we saw the port, and we could see the masts of ships in the harbor. Soon, we saw something coming towards us. It was the pilot. He came in the funniest boat I've ever seen. It was a round lug dugout, and on top of the lug was built a narrow place for them to sit in. It was so narrow that they could not but just get their legs into it. And then there was an outrigger built out on one side to keep it from tipping over. The pilot came aboard, and he was a native. He wore no clothes, <laughs> but a piece of cabin cloth tied around him. Everything seems strange to me. <laughs> Imagine this poor kid left Newburyport for the first time. There's somebody <laughs> coming up in a hollow log with no clothes on. He's like, everything seems really weird right now. I love him. Okay, Emily Pritchard, poor Emily. Arrived at Point de Gaulle about noon. The scenery at the entrance of the harbor was splendid. Pilot came on board. We are now moored and the natives are coming on board in large quantities. Some of them have very fine countenances. They appear very civil and pleasant. When I saw the pilot, I was disappointed. I somehow thought I should meet my dear husband. I could not think but that he was picked up by some vessel. Received a letter from home. Captain Crowell and Stevens called the scene. Isn't that about the saddest thing you've ever yeah. heard? Yeah. She's like, there's some chance that somebody picked him up and he's going to meet me and say, on. oh, her diary is uh, very, very sad. Okay. So once again, everybody uh, gets to Ceylon. The uh, missionaries and Mrs. Pritchard disembark and get on a steamer for Calcutta. They don't want to wait around for, they're all set with Sheffield the demon from the pits of hell. So then we, uh, but we're looking at the Elcano. We've tried to follow the Elcano around and you can see that um, on June 29th, the Elcano is listed as arriving on the 17th of last month in Gaul. So this is when they get to Ceylon. Um, from Boston, December 20th, in charge of the first mate, Captain Pritchard, having been washed overboard. So these are American newspapers. This is the first that they know. Um, he left in December, this is in June. This is the first that his family is gonna know that he's gone. Um, on July 11th, the Elcano is noted as having arrived in Calcutta. A few more mementos of Pritchard's life and death. Uh, this is his obituary in Marine Society uh, uh, records, and we know that his widow was back by March 20th, 1866, because that is when his estate was settled. So we're able to follow her path back a little bit, but actually, it turns out we have a lot more about her. But, oh, this is his headstone. She never married. They never had any children. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a minute. So what happened to the Elcano? Well, Sheffield takes the Elcano from Calcutta to New York. Uh, and you can see at Calcutta, October 21st, uh, these are, this is the, uh, the ship Elcano, Sheffield, cargo engaged at $14 per ton. Uh, and then, of course, the, the cabin boy says on November 11th this morning, we unmoored and hauled out into the stream, dropped as far as Garden Reach and anchored. Uh, and then down here, I know it's hard to read, but it says Elcano Sheffield, which means he's the master for New York, had engaged a full cargo of many tons of seed and 700 to 800 tons measurement goods. 
So then Graham and I had to go on a listserv and figure out what measurement goods were. That's goods that are measured by volume, not by weight. They're very light goods. Um, that's how that's defined, apparently. There you go. There's your cocktail party fact of the day. And then they get back to New York. So here they are in New York on the first. Elcano, Cheever, Calcutta. They switched captains. At some point between leaving Calcutta and arriving in New York, Cheever became the captain. Well, who's Cheever? I'll tell you. Captain Albert Cheever, born in Castine, Maine. His first trip to sea was on a new pinky schooner. His first deep sea voyage was in the brig Pocahontas. Captain, I don't know if you all know who the Pocahontas is, but we've got a bunch of pieces of it upstairs. It's a Cushing ship that wrecked horribly off the coast, off, off of Plum Island, um, and lost everyone on board. There's a mass grave in Old Hill. It's a great tragedy. Um, but he went to sea with Captain James Cook. That was his first uh, deep sea fish. I mean, his first deep, deep sea ship. Anyway, long story short, in 1865, he took over the, the ship Elcano. The Elkana was owned by John Newmarch Cushing, who lived in this house. So he still owns it? He still owns it the whole time. Yep, absolutely. So it's so built. This guy, Sheffield, he just decided I'm going to. He's a hired man. He's the captain. And it's I'm always. going to take it back to New York. Just Well, I'm sure he had some. He, he They would have had an agent in Calcutta who would have made the arrangements to send, you know, to get the ship back. Okay. But at some point, Captain Cheever, who's from Newburyport and who also works on Cushing ships, the Pocahontas is a Cushing ship took over. And I don't know if it was that he was the first mate, and then something happened to Sheffield, who disappears entirely from the record. Does Sheffield die? Does he get thrown overboard? I have no idea. But what I know is that Cheever's not going to have a great time either. I'll tell you what happens to Cheever. All right. So this is, this is Kieser. Um, this is Fred Kieser here. And we're going to hear what happens to him. So this is worth it. Ready? <laughs> We sailed from New York June 25th for Liverpool with a general cargo. After discharging, this is Keyser, we put the ship into dry dock, stripped, cocked, coppered it, loaded a cargo of salt, sailed for Calcutta. Discharged, well, okay. We had a very bad crew, only one white American among them. May 3rd, our Malay cook ran amuck in the night, stabbing the second officer on deck and left him for dead, then came into my room while I was asleep, stabbed me three times, killed the steward, and stabbed Captain Cheever twice. I then secured him in irons. Six days after I put into port, uh, in Mauritius for medical advice, and there ran into Nicholas Pike of Newburyport. We are everywhere, <laughs> all over the whole world. That's right. Our American consul tried the Malay, found him guilty of murder, and on the arrival of the ship at London, delivered him to the American consul, blah, blah, blah. The doctor said Captain Cheever would not live. We sailed again, and after a hard time off the Cape of Good Hope, arrived at St. Helena, Captain Cheever, uh, said they were doing what they could for him. He would not live long. The best thing for me was to give him cod liver oil and brandy. Kill me now. We sailed again. The Malay died, was buried at sea. Our American sailor also died and was buried at sea. Only American on board. At last, September 8th, we arrived in London. I was fairly used up, having been the only officer on duty for four months. We, could, we took Captain Cheever on shore. Lawrence Brown came on and took charge. That poor guy. Okay, here is the winner of the best beard... <laughs> Aside from that guy over there, best beard in this presentation, this is Lawrence Brown. Lawrence Brown lives next door. He lives on Fruit Street, 20 Fruit Street. Um, and he also is the uncle of Margaret Cushing. He's the brother-in-law of John Newmarch Cushing, who owns the ship. They're all related. It's all crazy. Okay, so he takes over command of the ship. And where are they now? Okay, he takes command of the ship, I believe, in uh, London. Did she ever die? Did what? What happened to Cheever? Is he dead? Uh, Cheever did not die. Cheever, sorry, I should have, I should have closed that loop. He came back and uh, became one of the board members of the Historical Society of Old Oh, by the way, John Cheever, the author, is his great great grandson, and wrote about him. I found that out today. That was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Captain Lawrence Brown, what do you have to say? By taking a chart and measuring it off, I have sailed in a straight track 950,000 miles. By reckoning our courses taken during headwinds and other adverse conditions, it is near 1,300,000 miles. I have crossed the equator 79 times. Besides carrying Irish or Spanish or Chinese passengers, I have taken cargoes of various kinds, coconuts, coffee, cotton, coal, chalk, cows, sheep, and horses. Firecrackers from China, sugar, salt, sulfur, linseed jute, and jute butts, and hides and castor oil from Calcutta, 
tin from Singapore, old bones and rags from Bombay, indigo and spices, tobacco and wines from Havre to New York, nitrate from Chincha Islands, rice deals, pianos, parlor organs, sewing machines, and Yankee notions in variety from New York to Australia, and kerosene to India, China, Japan, and Java. Done it all. Don't you kind of love him? He's awesome. He's got his feet on the deck, too. Yes, he sure did. All right. He didn't get stabbed. He didn't go overboard. Uh, so what happened to Samuel Henry Kellogg? Well, Samuel Henry Kellogg and Nettie made it to Calcutta in June 1865, where he would spend the lion's share of the rest of his life. He's still known for his treatise on Hindi grammar, and he is the first translator of the Bible into Hindi. Uh, Dr. Kellogg met his end riding off a cliff in the Himalayas on his bicycle in 1899. I kid you not. And there he is with somebody helping him translate. Okay. And scene. Can you, can you see this movie? <laughs> For real. He's like, okay. That's really what happened. All right. What happened to William W. Creasy? We don't know. Uh, we actually don't know that much about we're him because on. we're working on it. What we do know is that he was back in Newburyport by 1872. When he was 24, he married Mary Brookings, who was 19. He was listed as a clerk, which explains the great handwriting. He's obviously very literate and uh, educated. Um, and then he dies, here he is, William Creasy, at age 41 of heart disease in Newburyport. And that's about all we know about our little darling, our little darling cabin boy. He's listed as a painter. Not a fine art painter, likely, but his father was a ship painter, actually. His father was listed as a ship painter, so chances are he went into the family business with his, with his dicky ticker. I don't know. I want to know more about him. But if any of you are Creasy's, let me know. Bethany, was it unusual that he was so literate? I mean, they're, they're recording. Right? I think it's extremely unusual to have a cabin boy keep a journal at all, let alone one that's so, you know, literate and easy to read. Um, he's actually, he's, he's a pretty remarkable young man, so. Could that man be pronounced Cressy? It sure could be. Yeah, because he Absolutely. Marblehead. I'll bet that's the same family. I have his whole genealogy <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> we can find Very out. Very easily. Yes. All right, so what happened to Emily Pritchard? Uh, Emily was on board the Elcano from December 17th until, again, until Thursday, May 18th, uh, 1865, the first time she went ashore on the island of Ceylon. At Ceylon, she was advised that if she could get to Calcutta within three weeks, she could get passage to Boston on one or the other of two ships, the Golden Hind or the Cape Prince. She got, she packed up her belongings, she got on the steamer India. She's doing all this by herself. She's pretty awesome. I will also tell you, in her journal, in between crying and trying not to go to Bible studies with the missionaries... <laughs> She knows a lot about what goes on in a ship. She is constantly saying they're taking in this sail, they're doing this thing, we tack to the whatever. She knows more about them than I do, for she's sure. She's in her 20s, right? She's in her 20s, yep. Um, okay, she's from Joppa. She's a Joppa girl, so I'm sure she's been watching ships her whole life. Um, on June 4th, the steamer arrived in Calcutta. There are no entries in her diary from that date until the... Um, 5th of July, when she boarded the Cape Prince for her journey home, and you can sort of follow her journey here. This is the Cape Prince uh, leaving Calcutta, and then there's an accident recorded in a Boston paper, uh, which is from the, uh, let's see, that's from the 20th of November, uh, 1865, so you know she's home by November 65. Uh, wait, what? Okay, so she came home on the Cape Prince. Turns out the Cape Prince had just gotten to Calcutta after being captured by the Shenandoah, the Confederate raider, and being bailed out. This has nothing to do with Emily Pritchard. I just thought it was awesome. Uh, what happened to Emily Pr Goodwin Pritchard? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's hear what happened to her on the, on the steamer India first when she got off the Elcano in Ceylon and made her way to Calcutta. Wednesday, May 31st, 1865. Very warm and pleasant. Had a very rough time indeed last night. Steamer rolling fearfully. My large trunk was up on a kind of lounge, but after I had got nicely in bed, the steamer rolled, and out came the trunk, throwing the things out of it, and broke its key. was obliged to call the steward to help me. All other passengers are very much troubled with rats in the rooms, which had carried away two or three articles of clothing, and last night commenced eating one of the ladies' toes. <laughs> they were not content with taking stockings and eating last. How am I going to leave that out? Come on. <laughs> this woman's tough. I love her. I'd love to find a picture of her. Okay, so Emily Goodwin Pritchard is home by January 1866.
From 1866 to 1873, she boards. She's listed as boarding at 15 Atwood Street with her mother-in-law. Uh, 1873 to 1889, she's living at 31 Milk Street with her sister Ann Susan Betts, who goes by Sue or Suki. Uh, Susan is twice widowed and has a bunch of children, so she's probably helping her sister raise her nieces and nephews. Uh, she moved between 1889 and 1891 to 8 Horton Street with her sister and Susan Betts. So she is living right within about a two-block area in the south end. How many of you live within like four or five houses of those houses? All right, so next time you walk down one of these streets, I want you to think about Emily uh, Goodwin Pritchard living uh, in these houses. She's very much a Newburyport girl. Uh, I have her death certificate, which is a wonderful way to find out information about people, but um, from that we know that her sister was still alive. She is buried at Oak Hill with her husband. So... Emily Pritchard is buried at Oak Hill. Oh, I'm sorry. Her, her husband's, husband's buried at sea. No. But she's buried under the same tombstone as her husband. Sorry about that. By the way, uh, in case any of you are going to yell at me later, that's a bark, not a ship. Found that out at the traditional small craft association meeting I went to when three riggers from Gloucester sprang up and began drawing pictures of correct riggings for ships, which I loved. It was a wonderful education. All right. And we're going to hear... So this is the progression of the beards, right? There's Pritchard. There's Cheever, and there's Brown. A seafaring man has an attachment for his ship. If it is a favorite one, and especially if it has carried him safely through peril and uncommon adventures, and the Elcano had certainly obeyed her helm and carried us through many storms in contrary conditions, so that I had an affection for her and was filled with a melancholy sorrow when we left her decks for the last time, when she passed into other hands and when the German flag floated from her peak. So this is Lawrence Brown. The Elkana was sold to Germany, and he said that was my favorite ship of all time. Just high praise for a man who had sailed all those miles that he was talking about before. So here's the end. The lost vessel in days gone by, this is from Baltimore, was the American clipper ship Elcano. They had found a vessel that was unidentified, and this is the follow-up to that. Built at Newburyport, Mass. In 1864, she was afterwards sold to the Germans, who cut her down into a bark and called her the Momsen. She was finally purchased back by the Americans and cut down to a barge and put in the coal trade, hailing from Baltimore. They used, she gave her last measure of devotion to, to this country, for sure. Uh, 1903, he outlived the Elcano by two years. Lawrence W. Brown, dead, one more of our old sea captains in Safe Harbor. He died next door to this house where we are right now. So... There you go. That's the end of this. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I will just say, this is a great story, but it wouldn't have anywhere near this level of meaning without the help of Graham and uh, that context. So uh, I, really, I really want to say how much I appreciate that and how great it is that we have that resource here in the community. So um, that's all I have to say about that. You want to say anything? You want to sing a song? <laughs> Isn't it question time? Oh, yeah. Go for it. Question, question time. Uh, my question was, if they had a, a, a black crew of 1920 people, and the captain was basically the only guy who knew how to sail a ship, how did the, how did the deckhands know what to do? Yeah. Well, I can say we don't, we don't know that they were unskilled. We just uh -oh. know they were black. Uh, I mean, the fact that there were contraband doesn't, there were a lot of enslaved people working in on the docks and wharves and on ships mm -hmm. that were sort of rented out by their enslavers. If anybody has questions, I would be happy to pass them yes. along. I think YouTube no longer allows us to be able to watches. So when one wasn't on watch, the other would have been. Turn the camera so to landscape. The ship, um, and directing everybody Thank you so else. much for watching. Uh, and in the beginning, and again, maybe that's why things got a little messed up in the beginning, you're telling, pull on that, loosen that, pull on this, because they don't know what they're doing. And then as they, you know, within a few weeks' time, they pick it up and, and know what things are called. But there must have been a language barrier probably, too, at some point. Um, but I can't imagine that, that shipping on a, on a ship to Calcutta, they were completely novice. Hold on, Bob had one here. Oh, sorry, Bob? Well, uh, do we have any idea um, how much of the ice that originally left here <laughs> made it all the way to Ceylon and Calcutta? You know, that's really funny because everybody's like, they were out of water. Why didn't they melt some ice? <laughs>
Uh, we don't have any idea. We don't know what, we, we haven't been able to find the customer records that say what they sold it for or what the weight was when they got there, and we don't know the weight when they left. So if we can find the actual maritime official shipping records, we'd be able to know that. But that's why they left in December, kids, because right. they're going Where to- Where did they get this size? Fresh Pond. Yeah, it's Tudor Rice Company, right? Yeah, it's the Tudor Rice Company from yes. Marblehead. You got it. Uh, um, Oh, in the hot? Yeah. All right. So their agent is from an ice company. We, there are also other references to the ice, the cargo of ice in the di in the journals and letters. Elizabeth? I want to know when they started going using military time, because in these records it seems like there was confusion about AM and PM. So when did they, you know, like start doing 24 hour? Next question. <laughs> because some, in some cases we can't read the handwriting, so it's very, so we're doing our best guess. Um, and in some cases it seems like the date was written down wrong, but again, it's, it, it lines up with what's happening on that day according to 19 other people. So uh, what we can assume is that he's awake for 48 hours taking notes and is going to write it in the book afterwards. Having the date wrong seems weird, yeah. but maybe we're reading it wrong. Don't think so. But he's also... in timelines, right? Yeah. Same. They crossed date and timeline. They did, yeah. but not before he died. Yeah. They were still. Yeah, and also, you know, if you think about the the conditions, you know, the ship's moving around all over the place, and he's trying to jot this stuff down quickly between trying to stay on his feet and directing everybody and all that. So, you know, some of these, there was a an extra note in there. He kind of wrote it underneath because he. He'd forgotten that they'd taken one particular sail, and he was like, oh, yeah, and this one. So he's, you know, it's not like he's sitting at his writing desk clearly doing this. He's trying to record things as they go, and usually the things that you need to record are happening, at the time they're happening, you're engaged. You're not writing about it at that time in the notebook, so. Was the notion of, ca of keeping a ship's log a legal mandate, or was it a business practice? It was both, but uh, more of a, a legal mandate. So when you <clears throat> did you have the logs from the the, sh the one yeah. that wrecked? Oh, the Pocahontas. Yeah, no, no, the. Um, oh yeah, the Lila Mansfield. The yeah, Lila yeah, Man yeah. So the logs are extant from the Lila Mansfield because when you wrecked, you grabbed your log and whatever else you could find, but the log was the most precious thing um, because, as Bethany the other day so aptly put it, um, it's like the black box from the airplane you know it's, the, it's a whole record from everything uh, up until the crash and so you you want to prove to the the insurance company is going to want to know that you are at least trying to make port and weren't aiming for the lighthouse that you crashed into it seemed like graham you were reading from at least two slates from the deck log how many slates are there there are two sides to this slate in the middle so if you look at it right here it's i mean it's right yeah here. i can't see, see it like it's, yeah, it's yeah, bad angle. It yeah. But um, yeah, there are two pages. So two, one slate, two sides. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, two, two, two days at a time. Or one really long. Day. Or one really long. Day. <laughs> <laughs> or one really bad day. An eventful day. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Pritchard, I don't. Really, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> um, do you know anything about how the slate got to Ohio? Not a thing. Well, well, oh, no, that's not true. I, I'm very persistent. <laughs> what I know is that it was collected by somebody that was interested in the U.S. Navy, and so then did not had it for a long time because it wasn't really it wasn't what it said it was, it wasn't what he thought it was. So I think he sent it to auction. Thank you, Toby. Um, hoping that it would sell as a Navy document because those tend to be worth a lot more than private vessels, yeah. and um, and then it didn't sell because it wasn't a naval record, and then we got it and we were it. So that's all I know about it. I have no idea. Emily Pritchard had no children, so you can't pass it down directly in the family. She's living in the house with her nieces and nephews. I think the most likely scenario is that she kept it because it was the record of the, I mean, she adores her husband. It's the last thing he had. And then it sort of passed down in the family after that. Um, there's a man named Oliver Pillsbury, who's a relative of hers, who is the man who kept her diary. So it's possible that he had it, but I, I can't find any direct link. Keep good notes, people. Us historians want to know in the future. <laughs> Yes. So, so how tall would the mainmast be, and, and is that a single trunk or is that a fabrication? 
Uh, it would have been fabrication, and if I had to guess on a boat that size, how many tons? 1,210. Yeah. I'd say 100, 100 feet, 120 feet, maybe. And it was made up of three pieces, so you would have had a very heavy lower that was went from the, the keelson, the, the keel basically, above deck. Um, and that's where the, if you remember your sails, you have your courses, your topsails. So the course yard, the main yard, was right at the top of that lower mast. And then the top mast had the topsails on it. Uh, and then the t'gallant mast would have had the t'gallant and the royals on it. So, so that's about 11 stories tall? No. Mm. no. It's two school buses. End over end. Yeah. <laughs> I used to drive school yeah. Yeah. It's pretty high. It's high enough that it's kind of remarkable that William Cressy, Creasy, whatever, is going to the top of yeah. On a really cold day really where your hands up aren't working so well. With yeah. no harness. But that was the that was sort of the uh, the test, if you will, for the newbie was climb up that thing as far as you can go. You did that for fun, no? And don't use the lever holes. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's true. Okay, out of fear of asking another question. No. no. Um, do they, like, when, do these big boats that come in and out of, like, the Merrimack River, do, do you guys, do they still put pilots on them, or is that, like, a thing of the past? There is still a Merrimack River pilot. I don't know who it is. Um, it's not you? It's not me. Thank Christ. <laughs> when it's, it's very rare that they would need one and it would be for insurance purposes. But several years ago, when that barge hit the bridge trying to get to Amesbury, um, I believe there was a pilot on, on that. At least getting in the river, I don't know about going up, up north, but... Um, Did he have to turn in his log book? Yeah. <laughs> well, for, take drug tests. for insurance purposes. Yeah. Um, the Coast Guard. But there Hogg, are... The Harbor Master. Say again? The Coast Guard and Paul Hogg, the Harbor Ma Master, will meet him out at the mouth. With the tall ships coming in? Yeah, that's that's the that's the unofficial way now, but there is there is, I believe, an official pilot if if they need to be called upon. I don't know who who that would be. Um, Portsmouth is probably our closest big deep water port and they have several pilots. Um, Gloucester does go too. Salem Salem does. Yeah, Salem does. Gloucester. So can you just describe would he have had that under his coat? I mean, this is like his temporary thing. He's out on on deck, right? And the winds are blowing, the rains. Did he keep it under his coat? And then, like, if I, if I had to guess, notes? this wasn't on deck necessarily, but it was probably just just barely below. On a, on in fair weather, it might be on deck. Right. Um, but it was probably just down the companionway where he could get at it. Gotcha. Um, He's not taking it out in the rain because it won't yeah, work. Yeah. Although it does close, so it does. It does but have it's some paper too. Yeah. Which, you know, I don't think he'd be taking it out. And the, when the, the the kid, the, the what? The, William Creasy. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you say we have his log? We do. We do. It seems both Ray has it was mis it was misfiled because uh, it was being from the Eleanor, but it's from the Elcano. It's an amazing document. How did you find it? Um, I I I had help. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we went through every single ship's log because I had somehow missed that we also had other uh, James Knapp Pritchard's uh, logs from other journals from other voyages because I was looking for the ship, not the captain. Mm -hmm. So then we went back and looked through all of them. And Sharon Spielbanner, who's uh, the archivist from the library and is here part time, was the first to notice that what is this Eleanor? And that was, that was the smoking gun. And those logs are actually helpful because you can you start to recognize parts of the penmanship and one of the unique unique, unique things about Pritchard is that can go back on the things his he crosses his T's like well beyond <laughs> where the stem is and so as you read logs where he's copied his notes fair you can get a better idea of what some of the the letters are that he's using and then go back and use them to interpret this almost there I'm getting there. Stay with us. God, this thing went on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited. It's not my fault. There you go. So, uh, where's the T here? So, stay so there's the T, and there's the And that showed up in his other writing as well. That's cool. So we know that he wasn't writing anything on the 23rd, because he's dead on the morning of the 22nd. That's the big mystery, is why are some of the numbers wrong on the log. 
it can't. It is his writing, and it can't be him because he's dead. So that's. Did they, did they change dates at noon? There was a lot of that. that yeah, I, I wondered the same thing. Yeah. The celestial day. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. See, I celestial day. I don't know. Make, make it I just noon. assumed that was another name for the day I was born. <laughs> celestial day. All right, you guys have been so patient. Thank you so much. Thank you. the other side though. It, oh really? Yeah. So he seems to be like not engaging with the captain much at all. Yeah. And then later on he talks about this and he's got this kind of imaginary stuff about that. So I think he's probably just like hanging out with the captain. I know, I left that one out because everyone else is relaxing some reps on it. I feel like hey, maybe you're just going to start to make it. I just think it was I think partly because the people are the better. I learned so much. Yeah. I learned so much. 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 I Oh, so that's the book. Yeah, the book for anyone. Yeah. 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 On the audio Thank you. Way. Thank you. I'm sorry to be in your way. I hope that you not that way. has any. Hey there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this talk. And we are going to be releasing a an edited version of this that will come out, oh gosh, I don't know, in about a month or so. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you consider joining Lil's Bow Shop in the Museum of Old Newbury. You can live anywhere and join these museums and help them in their mission to preserve history, but also to teach other people how to do this sort of research, how to build boats, how to row boats, and to give people access to the Merrimack River. Thanks for your interest. We hope you visit lowellsboatshop.org to have a look at what we do. We have some adult classes coming up. For example, we have a Make Your Own Orders class. There is um, a Basic Basics woodworking class that is coming up. And we also have a Coastwise Navigation class and a couple of classes that have to do with making charcuterie boards. So charcuterie boards, um, those are going to be during the months of April and um, May. So 
Hope you join us for any one of the classes that are on our site. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in another live event, I hope.